All right. So it is time to start this, and I want to quickly explain what the heck this is. <laughs> My name is Justin Henderson. Uh, I've typically done things like Sans webcasts and stuff, but I'm trying something new here. My goal is to help folks build one of the most enterprise-grade, awesome, epically cool lab environments. Now, that should sound cool on its own, but I really want to answer the question of why. Well, I've hired a lot of folks. I have my own consulting firm. My partner's over here monitoring chat. I'm, I'm kind of watching it as well. And between the two of us, we have interviewed hundreds of individuals. We have hired some really rock stars. Keaton, sorry, just shout out. <laughs> We've also hired some folks that it just didn't quite turn out. Not to mention all the folks we've interviewed that it just didn't work. The problem is there's a whole lot of theoretical knowledge out there, but there's a lacking of practical knowledge. Uh, especially like I, I remember interviewing multiple masters or even PhDs and congratulations on getting that degree. That is fantastic. But as soon as I started asking them very specific questions, they could answer of how it should work but not what they would do to actually make it work. And so I want to kind of bridge that gap. And my partner and I, what we're trying to do is whiteboard today and design and talk through what we think would make a really cool lab, like with hypervisors and all the technologies you would see in enterprises that we do in like our professional service engagements. And then I'm going to turn this into a stream, a series of YouTube videos and walkthroughs so that you with some hardware recommendations of either new hardware used hardware, switches, whatever we decide can do it. Whether you're a business that's going to buy a small little lab kit that your employees can use, or you're a student just entering college and you don't have a lot of money, but you want to get a good paying job and hopefully enjoy it, this is going to get you there. At least that, that's my hope. So this is kind of that, that outreach and putting that out there. I will be monitoring chat today. And if I miss it, my partner will let me know. So if you have suggestions, you have questions, put them in there. Otherwise, let's, let's kind of dive right into this. So my goal here is we're going to kind of go through this, this kind of style here. I've got a whiteboard over here on my left. Oh, sorry, that way. <laughs> and I'm going to kind of draw out things that I want to put in this lab. Now, my handwriting, as my partner puts it, is basically a butcher. <laughs> it's horrible. I, I, I've got a nice little stylus here I'll use and it's still not going to be the prettiest thing in the world, but that's, that's not the point. <laughs> the point is, what do you want to have videos on how to set up, how to use, how to tune, just like you would an enterprise? So I'm just going to start talking off the cuff. I did not pre-plan anything here. I'm just if I were to say I'm going to build a home lab from scratch and had I been coming straight out of school or whatever, what would I have wanted to play with? I'm going to kind of say these are things I would I would expect to see in an enterprise environment. So I'm going to start drawing some of this on the whiteboard. If I miss things or you want to make suggestions, again, put them out. So here we go. Oh, yeah. So backup solutions. Sure. There's a, sorry. You, you said it, so I could put another. So even things like how about this? A backup solution, right? I'm going to go ahead and just put that on here. I'm going to put it over here on the side. So we've got, I'm just going to put backup underneath this. Again, my handwriting is horrible. So this will be like a backup server of some kind. And if I'm talking like practical implementation, it's getting some type of backup system in place, but also making sure it's done so in a secure fashion. You know, uh, the Ryu ransomware, that's that five hour news article you read where they went from uh, the zero login, zero day to a domain controller, from the domain controller to the backup system to enterprise wide pff, ransomware. Now, I'm not picking on them because that can happen to anybody, but we'll have to talk about ways we could try to secure that. Because one thing that happened in there is what we usually will have in an enterprise environment is something like a domain controller. That's DC. Again, my handwriting's horrible. Maybe I'll fix that one real quick. Boop, boop, boop. My partner's over here being like cringe. D. So this is a domain controller. 
And we're going to want to have Active Directory or something because many environments have that. In fact, uh, oh, Josh, do we have any clients that don't have Active Directory? Are you not going to nod your head or anything? He doesn't want to participate. Any, any clients that have act, don't have Active Directory? They all have Active Directory. They all have Active Directory, he says. Okay. Uh, I've seen and had students at SANS that did not have Active Directory, um, but they usually have some type of LDAP or some other schema instead. So I'm going to say we really need to have Active Directory. So we have Active Directory. We've got backup systems. Right now, we're kind of more systems side. I'm going to say on the underside of all of this, it would be nice to have a hypervisor. Like, where are we running virtual machines or where are we running containers? So underneath all this lab, kind of hiding in the background, is some type of hypervisor, one or more. Now, I already kind of posted some of this on... I believe Twitter on what I'm going to talk about here. And I did a poll. I fully plan on talking about things like vSphere, which is VMware's product, versus Proxmark, which is an open source, Proxmox, I keep pronouncing that wrong, Proxmox, as well as Hyper-V. Now, for a home lab, I'm just going to flat out say Proxmox is fantastic. You can do hyper-converged storage, where if I have three servers, I can actually replicate using the local disks as if it's a SAN, storage area network, shared storage, basically. That's awesome. So your home lab can have the same feature sets as what we would see in enterprises. That being said, I don't really see clients in full enterprise environments doing Proxmark. I see them using Hyper-V and vSphere. So that's why I'm also going to cover that. Oh, so why not VirtualBox or VMware Player Workstation Fusion? We're also going to cover that. But those aren't hypervisors. <laughs> just, just to be clear, those are not hypervisors. Those are virtual machine platforms. So those would be something like you've got a desktop or maybe a laptop. The L here is a laptop. And you're running virtualization in software on top of it. And don't worry, I'll, I'll cover that as well because... That's home lab and virtualization on a budget. You don't need extra hardware. You can literally use the machine you use to play video games on. Not that I play video games. I totally do. Okay. But if I have a dedicated hardware, I would encourage you to do a full-fledged hypervisor. Proxmarks, I think, is probably the best for a home lab just because it has enterprise-grade features at the cost of zero. Okay. So we'll cover that. We'll cover really all three hypervisors. We're going to cover VMware Workstation, Fusion, Player, VirtualBox. Technically, we can go into things like KVM. But I don't want to spend all of my YouTubes just on virtual platforms, because at the end of the day, if I'm trying to show like how to spin off virtual machines and do snapshots and all of that, I really only need to do a few of these. So I'll probably do things like VMware plus these hypervisors. Then the funnest part, though, is what do you put on top of them? So we already have a domain controller. We have a backup system. Um, what else are we going to put in here? Well, we need to have DNS servers, but I'm probably going to show DNS over here on top of the domain controllers using Active Directory integrated DNS. We technically could do a different DNS zones and have like a Linux bind server or something off of the network. I'm also going to say I usually like to have things like some web servers. Web. Yeah, oh, yeah, we'll get there. Web, which usually has a database. So I'll put a DB. And at this point, we're probably also going to treat this as DMZ internet facing stuff. So we'll have like a DMZ zone. Eh, that's horrible. Let's, let's clean that up a little bit. And DMZ here, I'm clarifying because in some countries it has a different meaning. This just means these are going to be services that we want internet accessible. The cool thing is, even if you don't have static IPs, I'm going to show you how to get these out on the internet as if they were static. So we'll do things like, uh, I'm, I'm a fan kind of, there's this software called Argo. A-R-G-O, again, horrible handwriting, but Argo Tunnels from Cloudflare. 
that will actually give you free TLS certs and it's a reverse TLS tunnel to a denial of service vendor slash web application firewall proxy that will let you access everything even if you don't have static IPs. And it's not just for home use. We actually use this in our data center where we do SIM as a service, like a, a software as a service SIM, where we protect things like the GUI front end where you do all the searching because it's denial of service protection plus reverse proxy, like a web application firewall and so on. So that's one method. We actually could also do something like, this is what I used to do, and this was kind of funny. Um, back before I knew about Argo tunnels, I would want to goof off and host like web content. I used to actually have a private World of Warcraft server, which I'm actually not a huge World of Warcraft fan. I just wanted to figure out if I could do it, and I did. <laughs> but I had really bad internet. Uh, this is being recorded, but it's my first time doing the live stream, so hopefully I'm recording it fine. So I'll try to post this afterwards. But what I would do is, let's say this was Amazon. What I would do is I would deploy one of their free tier virtual machines like Ubuntu, and I would set up a reverse SSH proxy to an EC2 instance. EC2. And what would happen is, an Amazon, this has a static IP. So my static IP for my home lab actually sat out in Amazon land, and the world would connect to that, which would then ride back across into my lab DMZ here. <laughs> and part of the reason I would actually do that is I would do that for reverse proxying, and I would do it for forward proxying with SSH compression because I had really bad internet lines. I grew up out in the country. <laughs> you should not do that in production, but uh, for a home lab and for goof off, yeah, sure, why not? But there's ways, and also if you're at home, you can ask your internet service provider to put your modem in bridge mode. You'll still probably be DHCP, but at least you could actually directly connect to that external IP. So we'll talk through some of that. So, okay, we got some DMZ things. Uh, Sam, you mentioned what about interaction with clouds such as Azure? We're definitely going to do some cloud stuff. What we're going to do with the cloud? Well, let's go ahead and go there. I already have Amazon. We have EC2. I'm probably also going to talk about EKS, which is their Kubernetes services. And specifically on Amazon, we also have their logging, which is going to be things like CloudTrail, CloudWatch, S3 buckets. And so I'm going to try to interact with those, one, to see them in use, but also because I'm a, I'm a big fan of like detection and monitoring. So we're going to pull some of that in. One of the big things we're going to do in these videos, just because I'm, I'm in this space so much, is we are going to play with SIP. Now, I'll mainly be doing that with the Elastic Stack, just because I'm... I'm definitely heavy, 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 heavy elastic experience. Um, so we're going to pull logs. Notice I'm putting the arrow this way because it's technically a pull from CloudWatch, CloudTrail, all of that. We're also going to integrate with Azure. And what we'll probably do here is we're going to do a hybrid Active Directory integration where we assume we have a Active Directory domain controller on-prem but it's also connected to Azure for a hybrid domain infrastructure. Also going to talk about things like, I don't know, Office 365, right? As well as their virtual machines and container infrastructure. For monitoring of those, well, it's the Office 365 management API, but you might want those for things like SharePoint, OneDrive, Teams chat, all of that. Plus, if you want the cloud tenant logs, because People will attack your tenant or they'll attack your Active Directory. We're going to need Azure monitor logs. So we're also going to pull those in. Again, it's a pull, which is why I'm showing the arrow going that way. Maybe, I'm just reading chat again. Maybe zero tour to connect the different services in a smart and secure way to create secure networks between on-premise cloud, desktop, and mobile devices. Yeah, we can talk about the tiered infrastructures and ways of doing that. And we can talk about things like... Uh, how about this one? Zero trust. <laughs> Good old zero trust. Uh, we, we've got day five and security 530 from SANS, which is the Defensible Security 
it, defensible security architecture and engineering course. Day five is on zero trust. It's not always practical, so we talk about fun, practical things like domain isolation, and I've got some things we've done for some of our clients where they interact with on-prem to cloud, but it's over public IPs, but how do we do that in a secure way? So we can definitely talk about stuff like that. Uh, from no gamer regarding SIM logs, are we going to talk about solution to show the true IP address of wireless devices, not the NAT IP of the wireless access points? That's a very specific question. <laughs> Um, whether I'm going to have a dedicated YouTube video on that, I don't know. I can say we can cover that in like, for example, in my home lab, I have FortiGates, which also double as my wireless access point and wireless intrusion sensors. So let's actually add that in because I'll, I'll for sure cover that. I'm going to add next gen firewall. I need to make that bigger. See, I should have just had my partner do this because he's a he's a little bit better of a drawler, but that's okay. Let's give it a little bit bigger of a box. Oop, I don't know what I just did there. I turned it into a table. So I'm going to do next gen firewall, which also is going to have. I have four access points hanging off of mine that do Bluetooth and 802.11 scanning. And if I had a large internal environment with natting, then the problem is if I'm on an access point, I can't actually tell who it is. But the logs you would get off that firewall, or if you had a dedicated wireless controller, would have the true IP. Now, going from things like flow logs to those can be tricky, but it is doable. Um, so maybe, maybe the question would be not specifically wireless, but maybe there would be a separate video potentially on how to find true IP addresses due to natting, regardless of if it's wireless or something else. So uh, let me think on that one, but that, that would be a good idea because that is a huge struggle. But so we've got an extra firewall. Somewhere in here, we've got our switches. So I'm just gonna do switch, which brings up the fun question of one of the data sources I really like is flow data. I can technically get flow logs off this firewall. So everywhere with blue is where I can get flow logs. I can technically get them at the hypervisor doing things like uh, OpenFlow with Proxmox. vSphere, I can do virtual distributed switches, which also can do flow data. And my physical switches, if they support it, could also do NetFlow, SFlow, JFlow. And then if we have flow logs, we can do things like beacon detection. So beacon detection is usually something I put either on the SIM or as a separate VM, but that can go and try to find command and control where system keeps beaconing out to the internet. Flow logs make a really good use case for doing that. So we might want to talk about that as well. So what else are we missing in here? Again, this is just completely off the cuff. Uh, we're definitely missing N, ah, sorry, the autocorrect thing is grabbing that. Do N, 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 NSM. Network security monitoring. Most of you probably heard of this through something like, say, Security Onion. Uh, could be Sourcefire, Tipping Point. There's a lot of products out there. But network security monitoring is going to get us things like intrusion detection. So we'll get alerts off the network, payload inspection. It's also going to give us things like Zeek or Suricata if you're doing it that way, where we're gonna get our DNS, HTTP, con logs, DHCP, Kerberos, SMB, potentially threat intelligence integration. Probably should add that somewhere in here. So I'm not gonna draw this on a box because we can actually do this at multiple layers, but we can integrate that there as well. To me, the issue with NSM, and I'm not saying NSM is bad, I love NSM, isn't how do you get it up and running because well, Security Onion's made that really easy. There's also Rock NSM, so Security Onion, Rock NSM, uh, Dynamite NSM, if I pronounce that right, hopefully. And there's more out there. They've all made it easy to get it up and running. You can even scale up to one gig, 10 gig, 100 gig plus. The issue I find for folks that are not so familiar with NSM is not getting it up and running. 
but it's on what do you do with the data? How do you tune and do false positive reduction of the IDS? How do you do things like BPF filtering to ignore some junk like the backup system? <laughs> this backup system is going to be super chilly. Do you really want to let it inspect and waste all the CPU and RAM going after that? So tuning, filtering, and then all the network metadata, DNS, and all those logs I referred to, how do you operationalize that data? You've got it, but if you don't know how to use it, it's a paperweight. So I think we'll spend a decent amount of time, and that's kind of NSM and SIM related, because to me, the SIM X is the central brain that puts this all together. So we're definitely going to go there. <laughs> so we'll add that in there. All right. Um, what we're missing from this is also, and we could potentially put this in the DMZ actually, is a proxy, a web proxy. Now, why I'm saying web proxy is if I do a web proxy, I can start to control who can access what. We could technically do some of this at the next gen firewall, but I want to show the difference between a transparent proxy and an explicit proxy. There's a huge difference, and it's because next gen firewalls have become so standard and easy to deploy, we're starting to lose what the value is of an actual explicit proxy. You know, for a home lab, this could be something as simple as like Squid, uh, but it could be something else like a commercial Z scaler or things like that. The reason I have it in the DMZ is because what about your laptops in the field? I'd like to still be able to give them centralized protection, which means it either there needs to be a cloud hosted proxy or something that can be reached from your DMZ. So we'll talk through that and how to tune that. Uh, Marcus, with all these moving parts, we need some mon Oh, Marcus, I swear, you're so much trouble. <laughs> Monitoring, this isn't an operations lab. This is a security lab. Oh, wait a minute, the confidentiality, integrity, availability, availability, monitoring. All right, yeah, they go hand in hand. So we're gonna have to have a monitoring solution. So these can be various things. Zabbix is definitely one of them. I'm gonna call this a network monitoring system. That table thing is killing me, I need to turn that off. Network monitoring solution. This could be Zabbix, it could be Nagios, it could be Isinga, it could be, there's a whole bunch of solutions out there. Even some commercial ones that are fairly uh, low expensive where you might be able to get like a, a personal use license. And that's things like SNMP, SSH, WMI, custom Python stuff. Uh, and that's definitely something we should consider. We actually just had some fun yesterday. We went to one of our data centers and we're trying to get better network monitoring. And so we actually took a Raspberry Pi <laughs> and our monitoring is actually all that software like um, Nagios Enterprise, for example, works on a Raspberry Pi. So, okay, that's fair. We'll, 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 we'll probably talk about something like network monitoring in here as well. Um, how about, can you, let's ask a question here. What percentage of the internet do you think is TLS, is encrypted right now? So I'm monitoring chat, let's see. Who can get this answer right? And it's technically different by country, but what percentage of the internet do you think is TLS encrypted? Any ideas? We'll, we'll, we'll go there in a second. 20%, 30%, 90%? Uh, Marcus, yeah, it's, it's, it's from what we're seeing, it's roughly 70%. Okay, okay, okay. So let's 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 talk through this here for a second. I'm gonna erase some of this here in a second. So if we're looking at encryption and we're doing antivirus, so next gen antivirus, we're doing URL content filtering, we're doing malware detonation. Oh, we need to add that in here. So I'm just gonna put uh, mal where detonation we'll talk through that so we're doing malware detonation which requires seeing the clear text traffic we're doing botnet detection we're doing application control we're doing intrusion prevention which also we can do with intrusion detection and in zeek i want that to be red there we go so this box over here 
We've got malware detonation. We have all these different systems that with TLS, then we can't see what we're dealing with. We can't open it up. We can't we can't do the technologies that we've already got on here and actually some that we don't even have on here yet. So that means what we need to talk about is TLS inspection and decrypt port mirroring and normal port mirroring and tapping. Yep, polar proxy it is. So what we'll probably do is have a video. I'm gonna draw these first and then I will put my box. I'm gonna add for sure polar proxy into this mix. What that's going to let me do is crack open encrypted TLS traffic, and then I can send a copy of it to my firewall, to my network security monitoring, and technically to the malware detonation and all the other boxes I want. So we're definitely going to have to include something like that, because otherwise organizations spend quarter million, million dollars on all these technologies. They don't work very well or at all with encryption. Will Polar Proxy help with things such as DNS over HTTPS? It can, but it also depends, because a lot of DOH or DOT, DNS over TLS, DNS over HTTPS, those get processed per application. So what might end up happening is that traffic gets blocked at the firewall because Polar Proxy or whatever TLS inspection technology you're doing can't crack it open, therefore it denies it which is still a, that's a, that's a good thing. <laughs> so it's definitely gonna help us, it just might not allow it at all because the inspection might not be trusted. Uh, Firefox, as an example, will do its own. Now, if you added the cert, this will go into the Polar Proxy. If we say, Firefox, trust this CA, and then Polar Proxy tries to inspect DOH, that should probably work. So but that's something we'll cover in that video. Sam, I'm going back to one of your questions because I, I skipped it. One of the challenges that work, you have to deal with logarithms, Splunk, or other sims, getting some pointers throughout the lab and how to apply those will be very helpful. Uh, that, zero problem. Uh, that is probably where I'd say our company specializes the most. We do mostly sim implementations. Uh, so I will have lots of videos and actually on SANS archive, as well as a few YouTube videos already, we've already started covering that, but expect a lot, <laughs> a lot on that. And we'll probably start a series about, okay, you have a SIM, so now what? Because by default, every SIM is horrible. <laughs> They're all horrible. And yet it's one of my favorite technologies. So we'll, we'll have to do that in a stair-step fashion because you don't want to boil the ocean. A SIM by default is horrible. When tuned, when adjusted, when you have the right data sources and it gets awesome. Uh, we've got a MITRE video out there that's kind of the concept of how we would like to cover things, but then the execution, that gets hard, we'll cover that. So that'll come. So, okay, I'm going back into here. I had something in here about what about endpoint or host solutions. Uh, I'm a, assuming when you said host solutions, you're talking about endpoint monitoring, like EDR, endpoint suites. We definitely need to talk through things like that. Um, that almost could be, I'm just going to scroll over here for a second. If I'm talking, say, Windows, we got Mac, and we've got Linux. So we kind of have three different mainstream operating systems. I know there's BSD and other stuff, so please don't skewer me. I'm not trying to offend anybody. We'll, yeah, we'll get there. So with, with these three operating systems, we need to talk through things like, well, for all of them, and I'm going to kind of cover things that should be on all of them, they all need to have some type of antivirus. Now, that goes to the point of, is antivirus really required because it can be easily bypassed? Which means we probably should show some videos on how easy it is to bypass. Because it's fun. <laughs> but yes, the answer is you still need antivirus. Well, we've got things like host-based Intrusion detection or intrusion prevention. I'll just do IPS. I'm getting lazy now. Host based IPS, which are often common endpoint suites. And these can include things like a little bit of uh, firewalls, host based firewalls. And they sometimes have what they refer to as app control. 
But when I see these in suites, it usually does not mean application control, like um, what we've historically called whitelisting products, and they're kind of being renamed to app control, which makes this even more confusing. These four tend to be in endpoint suites, and they're slowly being replaced with things like next gen antivirus, EDR, and there is an open source EDR at this point, uh, as well as you know what we call, I'm gonna call it actual app control, but it's what we historically called whitelisting. They're just renaming it. This app control down here is not the same as app control in the suites. Sometimes it is, but it's often watered down. With of these, I'm probably seeing EDR is the one that's taking the most, it's catching on the most. And I, to be honest, like from a, a SIM with integration with EDR, that has been fantastic. We will need to talk about some extras though. So for example, on Windows, we currently can install Sysmon. And there's Sysmon with the Swift on security config. There's Sysmon with the Olaf Harton configs. They do MITRE integration. There's some things that Sysmon, quite frankly, can do that often these can't. So it sometimes is not an and or an or. It's sometimes, a, I'm sorry, it's not a one or the other. It sometimes is an and where you do a partial Sysmon and a full EDR. So we'll talk through stuff like that. Um, for Linux, we have currently Audit D. But just FYI, hold this for a second. Watch this. Okay, it's not out yet. <laughs> but Sysmon is coming to a Linux near you. <laughs> That's going to be huge. Now, all of this still doesn't fix the issue, though, of what about some Mac love? And so we'll have to add some stuff on logging and because even like logging time servers and things like that are a little bit different on Mac. Um, I might actually ask one of my coworkers, Keaton, to do some of this because he's done some pretty fun stuff with Macs. He's even created some repositories and stuff like that to help get logging agents and stuff deployed. But uh, we definitely need to give them some love because there's more Mac laptops and desktops out there than there was say 20 years ago. So we probably need to do a little bit of coverage on that. And again, we still need to have these type of solutions on there as well. And so for all of these, we also need to cover log agents. There's other technology like FIM, file integrity monitoring. And Josh, am I forgetting anything? He's shaking his head no, which really means we're probably still forgetting something. <laughs> Oh, okay, that's fair. There's stuff that's endpoint related, but it's not an agent. Uh, patch it. Okay, so we need to talk through that too. So let's go back because we forgot patching over here. All right, so we need to add in patching, which watch where I'm going to put this. Patching. Justin, why did you put patching into your internet facing DMZ? So you don't patch your laptops? Oh, we make them come across the VPN. Are they always connected to the VPN? No? Okay, that's why I didn't put it internal. I put it in the internet. Well, what if it gets hacked? So could your web server and your proxy and... Wait, 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 wait. I, what, what would we like... Sorry, look at my partner's over here. What do we like to do to secure things in the DMZ so that only our internal assets can connect to it? Oh, we, we deploy a PKI and we do mutual TLS, which means you have to have a client and a server certificate and validate them both. Otherwise, you you don't connect. Okay, so for patching, just to be, just to be frank, what we'll probably do for the home lab is, what's this? Sorry, I like saying that. <laughs> Now, is WSUS the best patching? No, but it's free, it works well, it's easy to set up. It's not gonna do patching of like third-party products like Adobe Reader. Uh, technically, I should probably air quote that because you, you technically can. You can actually push Reader into WSUS, but it's a lot of work and I don't know if I would do that. But So we'll probably do PKI, which means we technically could showcase things like smart cards, 
We could talk about things like, um, this is kind of not exactly related, but you can use it for a smart card, YubiKeys, Fido, U, was it UT, I'm going blank here a second, UT, whatever, the acronym, someone in chat can put it in here, the acronym for the U2F, I think, I might have had that wrong, but the different forms of multi-factor, plus we also know things like SMS, uh, HOTPs, TOTPs, like the, the different one-time passwords. Uh, we'll talk about that, even though they don't all require certs. But PKI can help us do smart cards, which if you have certain UV keys, you can actually use those as smart cards. So for a personal lab, I think that makes sense. We do, uh, actually, I've got one somewhere on my desk. I've got one that's basically this size, which is really, really tiny. Like, you can get a YubiKey Nano, and those can actually do one-time passwords as well as smart cards, which is kind of neat. If I have PKI, I can also do things like device and user certs, which can make RDP more secure. It can make it where you can do user certs for like web proxy and other, like that's, that's that whole client server communication. And it will also let me do things like NAC. Whoa. Turn around here. Now, NAC is not something I'm going to recommend for most home labs, personally. We'll probably cover it. But there's tools like PacketFence and a few other open source network access control suites. And if you do it without a managed switch or access point, they're actually really easy to implement. Meaning you could have like a Netgear, um, a Belkin, like some home style devices that don't support radius. And these will work, but you have to route through the NAC, which is not what you would do in an enterprise. And if it's not what you would do in an enterprise, I usually don't like taking the time to put it in my home lab. Now, if you have like, you can buy really cheap Cisco switches, routers, some of your firewalls might uh, work with this. You could do full on radius 8021X authentication, Mac off, DHCP fingerprinting, all of that with these NAC solutions. Probably brings up the good point in that your home lab, your enterprise lab should not be on the same network as your family or they will skewer you alive. Because <laughs> you're gonna break things a lot. Um, which EDR are we gonna use? Open EDR from Komodo? Uh, we'll probably play with Open EDR from Komodo, but to be honest, I'll probably also see if we can do one of the trials of like CrowdStrike or some of the other enterprise ones. Because this is one of the aspects that the cloud providers, specifically Amazon, they let you do trials of commercial tools. You need to make sure you cancel the trial before the time's up, but it will let you play with the actual enterprise products. Um, so we'll probably do a mix, multiple things in here. So, okay. Yeah, Josh, so Josh just posted, does anybody else have any other topics that are not in here? And again, this whole time, feel free to put these in here. Like, it can be whatever, like uh, open flow or software-defined networks might be something we'll integrate here at the hypervisor level or some other solutions. Um, I'm looking at this diagram, trying to see what else we're missing in here. Technically, I don't have Google Cloud on here, but we'll probably do a little bit with Google Cloud as well. Um, Office 365, we probably need to break out the, its subcomponents, SharePoint and Teams and stuff like that, how we integrate with them. So when you say OT, are, are you talking operational technology? And if so, can you be more specific in what you're wanting to cover? Because <laughs> too broad, too broad. We technically could cover things like, um, I don't have like industrial control devices but we could talk about trying to emulate some of the challenges behind them by adding in things like uh, Zigbee. Oh, come on, Zig. I don't know why it's not letting me do that. Zigbee, Z-Wave. We've got Blue Bluetooth, you don't really see in Enterprise, but you have it at home. Uh, Zigbee, Z-Wave, 8211. We should probably talk just because it's a lab and it doesn't always have to be Enterprisey, but like I'm a huge fan of Home Assistant, which is going to let you do a smart mo smart device monitoring, like of all your cameras, your lights, your doors, your 
garage doors, all those things. Uh, so we can talk through stuff like that. So anyway, Zachary, though, if you can be more specific, just let me know. I could have been way off on where you were going with that because uh, we have way too many acronyms in IT. <laughs> so I'm trying to think. So we've, we've covered a decent amount of endpoint suites. Oh, group policy? Right. I say group policy, and to me, that's like Active Directory. <laughs> well, oh, sweet. Good, good job, JJ. Thank you. We need those things. But group policy is a tool. That's like saying, yeah, I want you to go deploy Active Directory. You don't, you don't deploy Active Directory. You deploy domain controllers, DHCP, DNS. You have group policies. You have FISMO roles. And all of those things are Active Directory. So with group policy, we probably need to cover things like, and I'm going to move over to the endpoint side again. We didn't talk about things like hardening guides and actually how to apply them. Group policy is one of the ways we could do that. Microsoft Intunes, that's going to help us do things like we do cloud-based asset management if you're going to goof off with some of the cloud suites. DISA STIGs, absolutely. And we also needed to go through things like vulnerability management. Now, most of that applies to direct endpoints, but technically we want to scan our firewalls, our switches, and everything. So a lot of this we're going to find here and then fix it with hardening. But I also want to go back here, and we need to add something like, uh, I'm just going to say Nessus for now but it could be Qualys, it could be OpenVAS, but um, I'm just not a huge fan of the free open source OpenVAS personally. And I can, we can, we'll probably do like a side-by-side -side comparison. Like we'll download the Nessus Home Edition and OpenVAS, run two scans and compare the outputs. We'll also talk about centrally managing and pulling that output into the SIM because it lets us modify things and better report off of that so we'll cover stuff like that as well uh dev sec ops is definitely booming um on that one that gets eh, i don't, don't want to say complex it's just different so things we're going to want to talk about i'm moving over this way now uh, let's go up there we go that'll work is we'll just say DevOps. this could be things like terraform this could be uh, Ansible. Uh, what's the other one that could be things like Puppet, Chef? A lot of these are preference. It's kind of funny. We get a lot of folks that tell us we should use these, and instead, I don't. <laughs> I use just I use pure Python um, because it gives me as granular control as I want. There's also things like uh, Jenkins and alternative ver versions of configuration management control. Jenkins is kind of cool. Uh, we can deploy those on-premise or we can use them in the cloud solutions. And so we'll talk about integrating all of this together for sure. Um, this will probably be a separate series just because what I want to first cover are the areas that apply to everybody generally, but yes, I, I definitely think we want to cover some of this. Will you talk about what to purchase hardware-wise? Yes. Uh, so this, and I'll just kind of give you a quick hint, you know, what, and I'm going to, I'm going to preface this. It's actually what hardware and software. So we're going to cover that. They'll probably be separate videos, but like, for example, what I'm currently streaming off of is an HP Z620. It cost me 500 bucks, but it has two eight core processors. So I have 16 cores and I have 96 gig of RAM. It didn't come with hard drives. So I bought an SSD and slapped it in there. I've had 50 virtual machines running on this one piece of desktop. And then I've, I technically added a, a NVIDIA 1080 card, but I've had my kiddos playing VR games while 50 VMs were running. So I'm working, they're playing video games. The room was really hot. <laughs> but yes, 
Uh, so we'll talk about cost-effective ways, which is why if I can have dedicated hardware that's even used, like an HP 620 or some of the other ones, I can run a dedicated hypervisor. If I'm on a, a shoestring budget, college students, right? Then we need to talk about how to maximize your probably laptop you're bringing to class. So that's where we'll talk through things like VMware versus VirtualBox versus uh, even things like, how about this, Docker. Instead of deploy, like let's say you, I'm saying in a video, hey, let's deploy the Elastic Stack. And you're like, oh, Justin, I, I only have four or six gig of RAM. And you want me to deploy a four gig virtual machine? Windows 10 is not going to run. <laughs> well, what if you did it as a Docker container and there's no operating system overhead? Oh, so there's ways we can really stretch the budget. Um, and that's still like we, we use like Docker or Kubernetes. We use containers for that kind of stuff in prod. That's our preference. So we're definitely going to talk about how to stretch the dollars. Uh, we'll probably also have a video on how to try to talk your employer into paying for this hardware and software. <laughs> because if you're an employer, I'm talking to you, get up off your wallet and take care of your employees. They need to be able to play with these things. Uh, e even versus going to some of these really expensive classes like my SAM classes, there's a lot of things you learn in a lab, especially if you have somebody, you're looking at them, right? who's gonna help walk through how to do these things. So it's not just like the hardware sitting over there and we're like, hey, Josh, here's some hardware, try harder. And you're like, go, go build out a lab, go build PKI out. And he's sitting there like, PKI, that, that's kind of intimidating and scary and complex. But instead you've got H&A security over here making YouTube videos that actually walk through how to set it up. Well, hopefully your employer can get up off their wallet and spend $500 or $1,000 and get you some hardware. So we'll, we might have a social engineering video or maybe a live stream. Maybe we'll have a live stream where you get your boss on here and I just talk to them directly. <laughs> uh, UPSs, okay, um, sure. Yeah, UPSs we can add in here. And I'm just, I, I like the fact that this is getting so convoluted. <laughs> UPS. So we'll do UPSs and I'll probably show like connecting those into the hypervisors. And if you buy the right UPS, you can actually say, hey, there's a power ad and just nicely power off my hypervisors before everything crashes, which is stuff you might want to do in an enterprise environment because of things like the blackouts. So yeah, sure. No, that's a great idea. So this is, this is why like originally I was thinking of just drawing this all out on a, a real whiteboard with my, my partner Josh over here and then coming up the series, but figured it would be nicer to let everybody have their own say because you're throwing out things that I like, yeah, I didn't even think to add that in here. So that's a great idea. So, okay. Even beyond hardware, having licensing for learning, we're going to have a talk on licensing because I absolutely encourage everybody to do this legally. Azure Office 365, you can actually do trial licenses for free. Amazon, a lot of it is free. If you've, if you've not used it, the free tier is actually free for a year. For me, it's no longer free because I'm past that. There's things that I do that I pay a smaller amount, but I get access to licenses, but I can only use those in a lab. So absolutely, we will have talks on how can I do these technologies while still being legally licensed. Because uh, one of the things I like, like the Azure and Office 365 trials, I like that, but I also really hate it. Why? Because I want my lab to be permanent. And if I have a 30-day trial license, a 90-day trial license, and all of a sudden that time frame's up, well, that means your learning's up. So instead, what I'll do is I'll pay like a, a, a Visual Studio subscription license. It's like $500 a year. But now I can have Server 2019 and all these other things, Windows 10 Enterprise, and I can deploy as many of them as I want, and I don't have to delete them. Or if I want to, I can, but at my leisure. So absolutely. Uh, if you can talk and implement all this, you'll have to. Yeah, yeah so yeah. 
Yeah, and AWS will cover their billing and how you can do their cost calculator. So it'll let you know what your projections are. And, and JJ, I, I think you are absolutely spot on with the overall goal here. Because in the video I released before this live stream, I was really honest if you watched the video in that like Josh and I have interviewed hundreds of people. And Josh, you've had zero that have done this kind of stuff. Yeah, so he's had zero, and you might actually have interviewed more than me, potentially. I've had two. One of them I didn't hire because I couldn't afford him, which was my fault for not listing the salary requirements, but the employer I was at at the time wouldn't do it. And then the other one, it's like, you know how you do like a, a chain of, like, you know, you do three to five interviews? And I was like, I don't even know if that, that person made it to round two. It's like, you're hired. <laughs> It's just, if you hear someone talking, and, it, and again, it's not about passion. Like, I would say I'm passionate about this. I, I love this field. It's like playing a video game for me, or at least it's close to it. But it's not about having passion. The lab is not about passion. It's about getting hands-on practical knowledge. Because if you're applying for a job, whether you're new to the industry or not, you come in, you interview with folks, and you're like, hey, I've, I've done this, I've done that. And you're much, much, much more likely to get the job. I, I'm not saying you're going to get the job because I have to do the whole discra disclaimer, please don't sue me. <laughs> but there's a really good chance you're going to get the job. And to be honest, if you do this stuff that we're going to try building out and you're having trouble getting a job, you let Josh and I know because we will put feelers out on your behalf. Now, if... You're not actually doing this and you say you are, I will find you. <laughs> because I'm gonna make sure before I put my name on anything that I know you're actually doing this stuff. I know zero individuals past myself and Josh who have actually done half of this in a lab. So just, and again, I, I, this is not like I'm gonna say, hey, deploy these things. I'm gonna show you how to do them. So, okay, what are we missing? Because this is already like, this is a lot. Uh, we're missing case management. We have no case management. We need case management. This is all of your alerts from all your products. Like alerts can go here, here, here. All of those roll up into case management, like the Hive. Uh, we're going to try coming out with our own case management soon. Uh, Jira, Service Desk, anything like that. So we'll need to add something like that because this is what you would look at you know, hopefully either in real time if you have enough staff or maybe once a day. Uh, if you're like the, I'm the all-around defender, I'm in charge of everything, you still want something like that. Um, let's see here. So we've got, trying to think of what network technologies, a jump box would probably be a good idea. Jump box. Uh, and this is more of over here and actually really, we probably need to have a completely different series on identity management. And this might be where like some of the multi-factor stuff goes. And this is where a lot of zero trust technologies that are practical come in. Um, yeah, I don't know, Marcus, if this will ever end. <laughs> it's never ending. Sorry. So in here, this could be things like multi-factor. Oh, password managers, oh, that's a good one. Password managers. Uh, what would you call the, where you control password resets, but you act like password policies, right? Password policies, and the reason I'm bringing this up is it's not about the built-in password policies, although we'll cover those. It's about extending the weak spots. Because if I use, man, I just keep coming up with stuff. We probably should cover OSINT. <laughs> Unrelated to this, but open source. If I'm using open source intelligence tools, I can find like all the usernames of a company, try to cross map that to their Facebook and LinkedIn and all these other sites that are linked to. And then if they've ever had password leaks, I can pull those down too. And because of the default password policies in Windows, Mac, and Linux are not sufficient, a complex, long password does not mean a strong password. 
I can actually integrate things like OSINT into third-party password management policies, and it won't let you change your password to an already compromised password. And it will tell you and explain it, and it educates the users as you implement it. So when you talk through that, um, when we've done things like the F5, like we use, it wasn't the, it was the access policy manager. That is what identity access management. And identity access management, I personally feel, even though we very rarely, like we used to do this a lot for clients, but we don't, we haven't had a lot of requests for this. I am identity access management. I, I actually personally feel is one of the most important technologies organizations need today. If you're trying to do anything, even zero trust, data centric, any of that, you really need an IAM solution. But I don't really care what it is. It can be a dedicated IAM. Like a, we've had a decent amount of like F5 IAM where we're doing pol access policies. But this is where we can do like dynamic allows. Like it's not just allowed an I. Based on the behavior of your asset, you can gain or remove access. Um, or how about this one? Like let's say you work at healthcare and you have insurance companies you have to submit claims to, but that major insurance company only allows local accounts and you have like a thousand employees that all need access. Well, by HIPAA, you shouldn't be doing that. Everybody has to have a unique account with logging. Well, you can use an IAM solution as a front end to the insurance company and actually do Active Directory to the IAM, which then does the local account to the insurance company. And you still have unique logons, uh, employee leaves, you disable their access, they no longer have access to that insurance company. So that, that's some really cool stuff. Multi-factor, password management, password policy, identity access management. That's also where you control password spraying and brute forcing and stuff like that. Uh, and then we'll just, I'm just gonna say authentication period. Because authentication is actually extremely complex. You know, Windows, as an example, there's multiple logon types, there's impersonation levels, and we probably should go through that. You know, Azure versus on-site and so on, tokens. Uh, so we'll cover that kind of stuff. All right. I apparently have been talking for 57 minutes. <laughs> Mac is actually already on the diagram. So we, we did talk. We'll probably have Mac in here. That's right here, my chicken scratch. <laughs> All right, three minutes. Is there anything we're missing? <laughs> the answer to that question, by the way, is yes, we're missing something, but that's just because this security is a good industry. There's so many jobs, so many opportunities. And if I'm being honest, most of us are generalists, meaning we dabble in a little bit of this. We don't, most cyber defenders I know do not specialize in one thing. That doesn't mean there's not jobs for that. Most dabble. Will this be laid out in Visio? That's a Josh question because I honestly won't take the time to do it. Yes. But he apparently said yes. So if, if there's no Visio diagram, it's his fault. Um, I will save this whiteboard session. I'll turn it over to Josh and he can try to Visio it out. Ooh, PCAP. So yes, PCAP, but that's technically part of this, the NSM solutions, because it's almost always packaged there. Although I wouldn't mind adding Moloch, Josh, as a dedicated PCAP solution in here. Yeah. Uh, so next week I teach, so I can't live stream anytime I teach, but what I will probably do is I will start a video and I'll record it before I teach or after I teach and we'll release it on Friday. I think the release schedule is gonna be every Friday. And if I'm not teaching, we'll try to do a live stream. I think that's the end goal. All right. One minute left. Can I, can I ask a question too? So he, here's something that Josh and I are pondering. Like I am absolutely cool with doing all of this and getting zero dollars. Like I'm, I'm totally cool. NetFlow, we'll, we'll talk about an NSM, switches, firewalls, VPNs. We didn't include a VPN. VPN. <laughs> I'm cool with doing all these and I am going to do all this for free. Zero dollars, I'm not expecting anything. 
My question though is, if I do all of this, this is probably just from looking at all this, I'm gonna say it's probably 20 to 40 hours worth of YouTube content. But even then with 20 to 40 hours into this, it's probably not gonna be a super deep, specific deep dive. If I were to turn the 20 to 40 hours where I go through these into a 40 to 80 hour class, but only charge say 250 bucks, anybody would anybody be interested in that? Like, would that be of value to you or your employer? So the free would be all of this still talked about in YouTube, similar to like this live stream or just me ranting. Uh, but then we'll do more of a more specific deep dive for a whopping 250. Okay, sweet Marcus. I think that's what we're going to do. I think we're going to talk through all of these, but then try to turn it into a formal class with like labs and stuff like that. Um, it would help us make money, but personally, just because I, I feel like this is like one of the number one areas that new cyber defenders need to get a job. And one of the things I struggle with is when things are free like this, we actually don't have a whole lot of viewers here. I'm sure we'll get more with the recording, but people don't value free as much as they do paid, but I don't want to charge a really high amount because then there's too high of a barrier. So I think I'm going to try to do both and see what I hit. But just keep this in mind. Maybe, yeah, maybe a Patreon account too. Maybe this is something that if you know you have kids, college students, friends, family, encourage them to join us on this journey because... I feel like this is the kind of stuff that will help change the industry. Get that theory and the hands-on, mix them together, life will be good. So, <laughs> all right. Well, with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop the stream for today. But just know next Friday we'll release another video. And then anytime I'm not teaching for SANS or traveling on vacation, which I don't really take vacation, but <laughs> we'll try to do a live stream. So with that, Thanks, everybody. This has been great, and we'll, uh, we, we apparently have a lot of work to do. <laughs> All right. Take it easy. Enjoy the week, weekend, and we'll, we'll start this journey together. Yeah, thank you all.